Hey, welcome. Just had a great conversation with Madeline McKinnon that you are about to listen to. Madeline is a certified nutritional consultant. She's a women's health coach, and she's really found her, her expertise and her niche within natural hormone balancing. So we start this conversation off talking about her and her journey, where she's come from, and we begin to pull all those insights based upon her experience and her learning along her own journey with food and nutrition. She has a lot of suggestions in regards to uh, estrogen we begin to explore that topic. Good estrogen, bad estrogen, there's the importance of progesterone. We talk about belly fat and she's got some suggestions for you there on that. We also talk about the adrenals and this kind of pervasiveness of you know adrenal fatigue. She suggests that in fact the spectrum and many of us we can find ourselves within that spectrum just naturally. This Our modern lifestyle is, can, is and can be very stressful. There's a lot uh, of demand on our time, our energy and our attention. And uh, so some really good practical tips there, including a little conversation about coffee. And I think you're really going to enjoy this. So I won't say too much more. Just know that there's lots in store for you here. And I hope you enjoy this call with Madeline McKinnon. All right, welcome. Today I've got on the call with me here, Madeline McKinnon. Uh, Madeline and I, we've been working together for a number of years. She was actually the third uh, staff member at the Light Cellar and it was a pleasure to work with her and it's been a real pleasure to see her grow and evolve and now have this, uh, this full on business of her own. And she's really kind of owned into a niche and a specialty of working with uh, women and with women's health and she offers a lot of different services consulting teaches on a variety of topics uh, but it's all specifically related to women's health and I'm sure that's a, where a big part of our conversation is going to go during this talk but I wanted to start off so I mean first of all welcome Madeline <laughs> yeah thanks for having me here yeah right on so you know here you are you have uh, you got a business natural hormone healing you're teaching classes becoming a, an expert in, in women's health and really helping navigate women through challenges whether it's all the way from you know weight gain or hormone imbalance or periods and, and they're all interrelated right so here you are today uh, doing that um, you know as I like to say I'm sure it wasn't always that way right it's been a journey to get yourself there and oftentimes as you know consultants professionals healers whatever terminology we most associate with um, it's it's come out of a result of our own journey to to bring ourselves to health and then from that space then we're able to share and uh, turn that around and, and help and teach others so love love to hear your journey where, where did you start and how's it been for you yeah so I started my health journey when I decided to go vegan overnight <laughs> and I was 18 and it's actually really interesting I think I was googling like how to lose weight because I wanted to lose a little bit of weight I wasn't overweight at all or anything but I googled like how to be skinny or something and then I got the skinny bitches don't get fat book that was really popular at the time and I read that book and I can be quite extreme and I wasn't even vegetarian and I went vegan overnight and I was vegan for a year and throughout that time I was going to university and studying political science. However, I was spending most of my time researching nutrition and learning about health and just my interest in veganism went into raw foods, superfoods. I got exposed to David Wolf's work and some other people's work and I started to learn about how nutrition, uh, just people have been able to heal themselves from certain diseases from nutrition and that got me really interested because I was like, why is no one talking about this? Why does no one know? Um, so I got into it that way um, and then I went out of being vegan um, and just started get recreating my own relationship with food in a different way but that was kind of how it all got in. Well, just when I was young, 18, started to learn about all of this. Right. And, and up until that time, no real kind of thought or awareness about food and nutrition specifically? Um, I think there was. Like, it, it just, it actually all happened really naturally. I, when I was younger, I really liked to cook and I've always loved food. I've always been a foodie. So when I was 10, I remember like baking bread, like getting books and baking bread and just starting to get interested in nutrition. So I was before that, but it was very, a very much natural progression to be interested in it. 
Yeah, and wow, overnight going vegan. Yes. <laughs> sounds sounds similar, maybe not quite as extreme as mine. Yeah. I was literally overnight vegetarian, eating just basically a regular kind of standard junk food diet to uh, meat and potatoes to just potatoes is what I like to say. And uh, yeah, it didn't go so well. Um, what, what was that journey, that transition for you like? And you said you did it for about a year? Yeah, I did it for about a year. And yeah, it was something where it's overnight I decided to do it. And... Yeah, I remember actually now that I look back, I actually felt really low energy for the first month after I went vegan, like instantly. I was felt such low energy, but I really pushed through it because I was really sold on the dogma of veganism and how it is going to be good for the planet. It's good for your health. It's like once you go vegan, the whole world is going to be perfect. That was the kind of thing that I learned from that so I was really like dogmatically vegan for a little bit like almost like a religion yeah. <laughs> and yeah it was interesting. Well was... I can relate and I mean you know the the ideals and, and the kind of noble aspirations are all they're all wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. What's your take on it now? I mean it's 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 slightly misguided uh, would you would you say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting when you start to debunk a lot of the vegan myths about about health, especially about how a lot of the research that about veganism is actually not actually that well backed. And the, the thing I started getting interested, which I know you did as well, is traditional food. And when you really study what humans have been eating for generations, pretty much as we've been evolving, it hasn't been a vegan diet. And especially, I think the most important thing about it that I, is the fats. I think that's really important. And especially as I study hormone balance, um, all of the women's hormones, the building blocks and men's of testosterone, estrogen, cortisol, the building block of those hormones is cholesterol. Right. So cholesterol converts into all these different hormones and eventually you get estrogen, progesterone. So I think there is a need for cholesterol, which you can only get from animal products and some other fats like DHA, fish oils. I think it's so important for the brain and for our genetic health and the health of our children to have these healthy fats in our diet. Yeah, for sure. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and, you know, I I went through that journey as well, vegetarian, vegan and, and you know, initially got some benefits once I'd kind of figured it out because, you know, starting off vegetarian, it was really just a junk food vegetarian, a carbitarian, lots of carbohydrates, mm -hmm. you know, simple sugars and processed grains, etc. Then, of course, progressed to, uh, you know, I think I did it very well, as, as good as I could. And then I went, to, you know, a little deeper down the rabbit hole, more extreme, raw vegan, and uh, kind of, you know, dragged my family with me, <laughs> which was, mm -hmm. we were young at the time, and uh, we just had a, a child, and and uh, we're getting deep into it. And, and though we, you know, my daughter was still kind of, you know, breastfeeding age uh, through those early years. But uh, as I began to notice, you know, personally, my own kind of s symptoms and, and things like showing up just from being depleted and the diet not being enough, where it really showed up was, was for my partner, you know, Laura, having you know, carried a child, delivered a child, now it was like feeding a child and it was just clearly not enough. And yeah, I, I love how you brought it back. I mean, this is your focus and your specialty, really speaking to women in, in the most optimal diet um, that, that's required. And, and like you say, it's it's the fats, it's the hormones. Um, you know, for maybe for anyone that, that is vegan right now or that's maybe gone through that and, and is just beginning to try and like understand uh, what happened there and what was missing. Uh, is there anything else you could share? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think the other important thing of a vegan diet is, is you know, we uh, it's with protein, we're always, when you, I was vegan, it's like you're always like, oh, of course you can get enough protein, but you also have to be aware of optimal levels of protein. And I really consider that about 20 grams, 15 to even 30 grams in a range per meal. And it's really hard to actually get that eating a vegan diet unless you're going to eat a cup of lentils with every meal. You get a 22 grams of protein. But the reason why this protein is so important is because it helps keep your blood sugar balanced. And it can be very hard when you're eating a vegan diet to keep your blood sugar balanced with enough um, 
carbs and proteins and fats and to get that right balance is more challenging and also the other foundation for hormone balance is blood sugar balance because when your blood sugar is off it affects your thyroid and your cortisol levels your adrenals um, so that's an important thing um, the fats the healthy fats are important um, but I've really seen a lot of cases and this is what happened for me just when I started to transition out of being vegan I got an energy boost I had so much more energy I really did feel quite low energy throughout being vegan mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure exactly why that was but when I started eating a little bit of beef I felt so much better yeah um, could have yeah. been the B12 could have been the iron <laughs> yes been, you know, yeah energy. and I also gained weight I think I ate ended up eating a lot of carbs so when you know, you, you when you're vegan, you like to read the nutrition. So, oh, I, I, I remember drinking because I was at residence then at university in BC and I was drinking these like organic pops because they were vegan. Right. <laughs> and because, but I wasn't paying attention to the sugar. So that's something that, you know, to get that optimal level of fats and proteins to keep your hormones healthy. Um, and your energy well and to prevent weight gain that's it's, it's, it is more challenging to do it unless you're really really try hard to find it and a lot of vegans will end up relying off soy as well right. um, and because soy is a great source of protein but um, soy has a lot of estrogen in it um, I was reading some statistics some numbers and the female body produces um, 400,000 units of estrogen a day and um, four ounces, which is a lot, I don't think you're ever, of vegetable oil, which is soy oil, or three ounces has a has 100,000 units. Wow. Which is the same as the birth control pill. Wow, yeah. And, uh, soy milk, um, a cup of soy milk has 10,000. Right. So that's a lot. It is. To impact your hormones. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> wow. And a lot of men do that too, like um, drinking soy, soy drinks and... It's a it's it's a significant amount of estrogen. For sure. Well, one of our kind of uh, you know compadres, uh, Denis, who also worked at Light Cellar and is out there as an educator. He always, I mean, he's into the myths and the stories and the legends, and he always uh, I remember that story. He quite tells fondly about you know oh. if, if the Japanese woman is ever you know like upset at her husband for him being you know unfaithful or whatever, she'll start feeding him soy to yeah. kind of influence his hormone levels and his libido. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And it's important. And I think a lot of the times we think, oh, men have high libidos enough, like, you know, it's fine if they have soy, but um, men's testosterone is incredibly important. It's not just about sex drive. It's about, it actually prevents depression. It helps them be more confident, think better, put on muscle. So like men's hormone balance is also important. Yeah, no, totally. And, you know, the little bit I've research I've done, uh, you know, for men's health and testosterone, like a big part of it is, okay, you know, what can we do to, you know, the avoids, you know, for high estrogen foods. Um, and this isn't that, oh, no, estrogen is bad, right? It's all about having that right balance and make sure we're not getting an excess because there's, I've heard there's a lot of excess kind of in our environment, you know, uh, from, you know, xenoestrogens mm -hmm. uh, and, and a lot of the plant foods as well. So, you know, what are the foods to avoid? And then, what are the foods to kind of increase, you know, for a man and testosterone? Um, how about we shift over over to women and, and you kind of give your insight of, you know, kind of maintaining that optimal balance? Is it, is it kind of similar to men where there's certain foods to avoid and then certain foods uh, to <laughs> include? Yeah, definitely. I think um, so estrogen levels are are really important. We need estrogen, so you don't want to try and lower your estrogen. Um, there's actually three different types of estrogen in the body. There's like the one that you produce, the ovaries produce, um, and it's the most important one. And then there's another one, we call it E1, and it's what women will produce in, in menopause. Um, but sometimes, yeah, you have to really help support those estrogens because you have to make sure that your body is metabolizing the estrogen that you're creating into a usable form. Right. and Men need men also. So there's if you get the right nutrients like fat, broccoli, anything in the broccoli family, and beets and goji berries and even egg yolks. Um, all of these have nutrition that can help your body actually metabolize. Use the estrogen that you need. Make sure it's good estrogen, but it also helps your liver detox it and remove it from the body. So you have to make sure you're producing the good stuff, but you're actually detoxing it when you don't need it. Right. 
Yeah, and making sure that you're avoiding all the bad stuff that's coming in because there's bad estrogens too. Right, and, and what would kind of like uh, maybe symptoms or signs that you know your body's not utilizing it? What would be the kind of the uh, yeah the the problem with ec that excess estrogen? How would that be showing up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for women that are menstruating, usually. Um, estrogen dominance, so when you have too much estrogen or maybe you're not getting rid of it, um, one of the main things is PMS. So I really like to monitor how my estrogen levels it are by the amount of PMS symptoms that I have because um, bloating, so what estrogen does is it actually makes things grow in the body. Mm -hmm. Estrogen is what gives women like boobs and curves when they become, when they hit, when they go through puberty. Um, but yeah, so with estrogen, it makes things grow. So it's going to grow the endometrium lining. Um, so if you, women have really heavy periods, the more estrogen they have, then the more that will grow, their lining will grow. So they'll have more heavy periods, but there's also things like endometriosis and cysts and even some cancers can, they thrive in an estrogen dominant environment. Um, so, and bloating, um, fat cells, actually the more, the more fat, not fat cells, but the more fat that you have too, then you produce more estrogen. Right. Uh, so it's, it's kind of, when you think of it that way, it's like estrogen makes things grow. Um, and the way that we balance that, we want to make sure you're producing enough progesterone because the progesterone is what's dominant in the second half of your cycle after ovulation. Progesterone kind of stops everything from growing and it helps calm your mind. It helps prevent those PMS symptoms as well. Uh, so you have to make sure you have that balance in your in your leg body. Yeah. And, and how many would you say that uh, a lot of women in our day and age are affected by this and, and probably maybe don't know it? Um, I think so. I think a lot of women do because we are the we are just exposed to a lot of estrogen in our in our in our environment. Um, but I think that just from if you eat a regular standard American diet, you're likely not getting the right nutrition to process that estrogen and to build your progesterone. Uh, another thing too is if you're stressed, then your progesterone levels will usually decrease. So then you can get in that more estrogen dominant state. So a lot of women do experience that for sure. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, thanks for being being a light and, you know, bringing this information forward. And you do that through your articles, through your workshops. And mm -hmm. uh, I know you have more kind of that you're going to be creating online so we can reach a, a broader audience. Mm -hmm. um, I know a huge kind of issue for a lot of women, especially in this modern day and age that you might want to speak to is, is uh, you know, the adrenals. Yeah. Yeah, adrenal fatigue, that's a really big thing too. Um, and adrenal fatigue is very much caused from stress. Yeah. And stress is such a huge issue. Um, so most women that are in adrenal fatigue, which is, there's different stages of that, and I really cover that quite in depth in my courses, but usually you'll know you have adrenal fatigue if you're just tired. You just can't wake up in the morning or you're feeling really tired all day, and then you get an energy, this weird wired energy at night, and then you can't sleep, mm -hmm. um, like belly fat, um, just feeling brain fog is another huge thing. I'm actually quite surprised how many women experience brain fog. I've done different questionnaires at classes, and it's almost like everybody has brain fog. Yeah. Uh, that's a big thing. Yeah. Yeah, we're almost all existing in this highly stressed out state. Uh, mm -hmm. And eventually, right, the physiology begins to kind of, you know, change and, and respond to that because it, cause it yeah. is so constant. But to us, it just kind of becomes this normal, right? It's like, oh, well, you know, life is busy, right? And mm -hmm. for many women that have families and running the household and probably work on top of that. Yeah. Uh, like, I'm sure a lot, a lot can relate. Yeah, definitely. It's like our um, women's stress systems are a lot more delicate than men's. <laughs> Actually, men can handle more high stress, but with women, because we have a lot, it, it, everything's a little bit more intricate in, um, with our stress system. So when you're stressed, what your body's doing is it starts to function in the fight or flight. So you're feeling, you have that fight or flight response. So your body's actually feels like its survival is at risk. So then you put things, then something will happen, like you'll put on belly fat because the, there's wisdom behind the belly fat actually. And I think a lot of women need to know this, that um, when you put on belly fat when you're stressed, 
Um, it's because of this ancient evolutionary response that you, um, your body's worried about starvation and potential famine. So you put belly fat on because if you're actually starving, it's the easiest fat that will, your body will be able to give you energy so you can survive through a famine. So right. I like to tell women, it's like, it's actually not you. Your body's doing the right thing. You just have to like get out of survival mode. Right. Yeah. Love your body. <laughs> it's doing the best it can, right? It is. It's doing a lot. Yeah. And it's like fertility usually drops too. So progesterone drops, your thyroid drops. It just um, doesn't prioritize fertility and reproduction when you're in adrenal fatigue. Yeah, I mean, maybe you know what the current stats are, but I remember hearing um, it's very common, right, uh, for uh, couples to have, you know, high rates of infertility. That's just kind of where our society is going and, and hearing yeah. you mention that stress could be one of the biggest underlying causes of that. I'm, I'm sure there's more to it, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really think it's, yeah, stress and nutrition. Yeah. A lot of the times, yeah. So so let's say, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure a lot of people listening can relate to that. Either they're experiencing this now or, they, or it's, you know, that, that kind of stress or strain on the adrenals. Um, I know a lot of us, we tend to go for, you know, coffee. This isn't coffee, but, you know, some mm -hmm. sort of like stimulating beverage with its mate or green tea, like something to kind of give us that little bit of boost of energy, uh, whether it's in the morning or that afternoon lull, uh, whatever it is. What are some of your kind of good recommendations? Um, let's just assume it, you know, maybe we're not full blown adrenal fatigue, but some of us are already okay. on that spectrum of, you know, feeling that tired, feeling that and, you know, that quick, yeah. reach, the sugar, the caffeine, like, what, what do you suggest as a good um, add or alternative to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, definitely replace your coffee with um, some medicinal mushrooms or some adaptogens, usually something you can get at the light cellar. That's where I send all my clients to get everything because they're all these adaptogenic herbs that you guys carry, they're all, they all help your body modulate your stress response. So they're going to help instead cough. What coffee is doing is it's giving you fake energy because it's making you boost the adrenaline and it's, it's giving you not real energy, but when you have, when you replace it for a time with a really good medicinal adaptogenic elixir, like reishi mushroom or reishi chaga, um, Siberian ginseng, something like that, that will help you restore your adrenals. You can actually get real energy that's actually coming from your, your body's natural energy reserve rather than this depletion. Right. For sure. Yeah. And, and that's a great suggestion. I mean, maybe I'll add to that. And, um, is, is there ever a time before I add to it, maybe we should ask, um, is mm -hmm. there a time that, you know, if someone's in that state, you absolutely recommend like, you know, no coffee at all because you've hit such a point or is it kind of, I was, my, my suggestion anyways was going to be, you know, I, I know for a lot of people, it's like, oh my gosh, life without coffee, you know, life without chocolate, yeah. whatever this is. Um, I, I assume, and just looking for your confirmation, there may be a time and a stage where, okay, we got to go, we got to cut it off completely to kind of heal. Um, but maybe for the average person, I was going to suggest, yeah, for okay, sure. Yeah, so you go ahead. Yeah. yeah, what I recommend is when you're actually really stressed. Um, so another thing with adrenal fatigue is you might find you get a lot of anxiety and overwhelm. So if you're starting, if you feel like you're at that point, coffee is just going to make things worse. I per personally, I like to drink coffee when I'm really relaxed and I'm on vacation and during the weekend because I can. it's not going to have that effect. But if you're already stressed, coffee can just send you over the edge. So you have to be careful about that. Um, one thing you can do is if you really love stimulants and you really need to have them is replace your coffee with matcha uh, because matcha does have stimulants in it, but it has a different effect on the body. It's more of a mental, it is going to give you energy, but it's almost this intellectual stimulant and it actually has components that are going to help calm down your brain. It has L-theanine, which actually people take supplements for anxiety and it's in matcha. So you could do that. Um, or you could add mushrooms to your coffee as well. Uh, if you're going to have some coffee, um, bolster it up with medicinal mushroom powders, which you probably have tried. I really love it because uh, the medicinal mushrooms, they're adaptogens. They're going to help you adapt to stress, but they um, actually taste really good with coffee. They have, you won't, it will actually, some people think it makes their coffee taste better. Yeah. They have a coffee-like flavor, so you can mix that up as well. 
Totally. They got that nice kind of dark earthy synergy. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I've, I've done some videos. You can check it out on uh, YouTube of, of how to do that. And that's either brewing up a medicinal mushroom tea, then making your coffee with it or make your coffee how you make it. Or even if you're out and then you have these medicinal mushroom extracts and you can just kind of, you know, by the capsule or the teaspoon, you put them into your coffee, stir it up yeah. and you're good to go. Yeah, just mix it in. Like we really like to make butter coffee, so we'll make coffee, blend it with some butter and coconut oil, like a bulletproof. But we don't use the bulletproof brand. But we'll just blend it and then add some medicinal mushrooms to it, and it's really good. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yaro always jokes he likes to use the term uh, butterproof. You know, you butter oh, yes. coffee, so <laughs> That's good which awesome. is essentially what you're doing. You're adding butter when you're coming back to those fats, right? And, yeah. and that must also be fats. another key part of this equation as well. Yeah, definitely. Because the other thing is never drink coffee on an empty stomach what can really go wrong is if you have coffee and a sugary treat like if someone eats a muffin and a coffee what that's going to do is it's going to make your blood sugar go up and down and up and down and up and down the whole day right. and it can spike the adrenals more anxiety um, but if you want to really heal your adrenal fatigue you really need to make sure you have blood sugar balance so having your coffee with a meal is very important to a meal that has fat and protein and some complex carbohydrates if you want, but it's not essential. Yeah, cool. No, great, great suggestions. And uh, yeah, I know, I remember there's a, there's a multi-level marketing company out there. They describe they have the healthiest coffee in the world. And oh, yeah. <laughs> really, all they've done is they've added reishi mushroom to the coffee. And yes. so, I mean, that's a great thing. Like you say, reishi is an adaptogen. Uh, and I love that term, right? Like just adaptogenic to be able to adapt to your environment, to certain stressors, to everything that's going on in the body. But something like reishi and these other medicinal mushrooms have so many other benefits too, right? Like you're, mm -hmm. you're feeding your immune system and giving it a boost. You're helping your cardiovascular system. And like there's so many benefits to the mushrooms um, and literally just by adding them in every day is is, uh, is a great way to go so mm -hmm. definitely yeah cool all right so um, what uh, what are some kind of some other quick easy ads that uh, someone listening might be able to kind of uh, be able to integrate some little gems of wisdom and, and insight from Madeline here Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really am into the macro and the micro of nutrition, and that's been a huge thing in my relationship with food is um, sometimes when we get into superfoods, we can get into the details a lot. So I used to be really be into, I, I, I used to only think of hormone balance as having those herbs, but it really has to be a holistic approach. So you want to make sure that you have these foundations in place. So the foundations of nutrition are making sure that you are hydrated and that you're getting moving and also that you're not feeling in that stress response. And these are very big picture things, but I think sometimes in the health community, we can kind of forget about those things because we go into the details. Um, so I think that's an important thing to cover too. And I also find when you get into this macro element, it also can really lead for a lot less confusion and everything too about nutrition so right. um, you can start when you start with your foundations and you feel like those are really good and then you can expand into other areas more of the details of the micronutrients yeah I know that, that's a great uh, great comment and I can absolutely relate and 100% agree that uh, you know as as I got in nutrition as you do and often us who look to food and nutrition yeah like we kind of put these you know these blinders on and we tend to go really deep and it's yeah. all about like the deeper and deeper and more yeah. subtle micronutrients uh, which is his own maze to kind of navigate but uh, yeah I remember kind of waking up one day of like oh yeah I forgot about exercise I forgot about yeah. like all these other things that yeah. make us hell yeah, I see that like, there's two things. There's the um, macro nu nutrition I almost see as that bodybuilder, like the typical bodybuilder that it's like get your fats, proteins, and carbs, and exercise, and drink water. Yes. And they have that piece covered. But then I think that sometimes their health maybe isn't in the best shape because they're probably missing micronutrients because if they only eat chicken and rice and broccoli, I don't think you're going to get enough. Yeah. But we have to find the wisdom of both of those sides and combine those because there's a lot of important things in that bodybuilding side of nutrition. And then there's a lot of important things with, um, yeah, all the micronutrients and the superfoods and the herbs and, um, yeah, minerals. They're all, they're all so important, um, but if we can find a system of learning to um, 
like learn about them and, and apply those to our lives, I think it can really help a lot of people be less confused about food and nutrition. Yeah, which is huge. I, I, I see that a lot. Um, yeah. Like what to eat and, and you know, partly our, our culture and society is, is to blame just for how we are raised and, and mm-hmm. the type of knowledge we're given. Uh, for a lot of what, what's your advice for someone that um, you know has stepping out of stepped out of the kind of you know societal norm yeah chosen to you know make their own decisions you know it is a bit of a gauntlet right mm-hmm. you read books you listen to interviews you read articles and yeah it can be get, get very well, yeah for sure because yeah we're, we're we're coming from the conventional education as the Canada food guide um, and it's just Oh, so much of that is actually based off of these industries, like the dairy industry, the meat industry, the grain industry, paying the government to promote their product. And it's not its not really conducive. And I was just thinking, instead, we actually need to have a different food guide for people to follow. And I think the macronutrients are important because a lot of people um, don't might not even know much about fats and proteins and carbs and how to balance those. So that's important. Um, but yeah, how to navigate the world of nutrition that, and like trying to find out the approach that's best for you is a really big subject. <laughs> for sure. It's like, it's an exploration for sure. I don't know. Like I have so much to say on that. You might have to ask me another question to dive deeper because I'm like, I don't know. It's, there's a lot on that. Yeah. And ultimately really, you know, since it is so big and so broad, really it comes down to an individual approach. And I'm sure that's what you do when you're guiding your clients. You really see somewhere mm-hmm. where, where someone was at, is at and then lead them step by step you know, yeah. towards that self-sufficiency and that understanding. Um, Cause I don't know, I think you'd probably agree. Like, even though you and I have chosen to study food, to study nutrition, I don't think at all it should be everyone's full-time focus, you know, not even remotely. I think food, yeah. you know, in its essence, it is simplicity and we need a certain level of understanding um, and we probably need a little bit more just to combat the, yeah. the confusion. But beyond that, like, let's get on with our day. Let's let's do other things, yeah. right? That's so true because a lot of people can get really deep into food and we see the extreme of people developing eating disorders of being very obsessed with food. There yeah. are like people that really feel like that. And then there is kind of a spectrum. So you don't want to fall too far on that spectrum of feeling like food is controlling you um, because essentially you just want the food to nourish you to continue on with your day. Um, But really one one set of advice I have for people that are just getting into food and nutrition is to first focus on how your body feels when you're like how you feel in your body because there's going to be so many diets that people are recommending and so many different dogmas floating around on nutrition like paleo, veganism, Um, And don't adapt, just be very skeptical about these dogmas because um, when you start trusting a dogma more than how you feel in your body, um, that will not lead to health. You have to really first trust how you feel in your body and really establish what, what you do want. Do you want energy? Do you want clarity? Do you want focus? Focus on those internal things first. Yeah. All right. I want all those things. Yeah. <laughs> That's the first. And then let that be your guide. Yeah. So guide guide from there rather than seeing somebody that just looks, you know, on Instagram, seeing a fitness model or just somebody that has a really is very convincing in their approach to food. Right. Um, first, just, yeah, trust how you feel. Because that's the thing. When I went vegan, I felt low energy. <laughs> right. And if you'd listen to that. Yeah. Yeah. But I was more convinced to that dogma of veganism. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. Having been in that community for so long, and especially like raw vegan, like it was always there was always this like, oh, it's just cleansing. It's just a cleansing reaction, you know. Yeah. And it's like, well, how many years of cleansing, <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. I've even heard. Um, I even saw a comment of someone online um, that was saying um, that with vegans, it was like because it was about, oh, from this like in this women's group, and they were saying this person wrote an article who was vegan that it's like oh you're vegan, so your blood is so pure that you, you know you you don't need to have your period. You're you're just gonna absorb all the blood back into your body. Right. Yeah. And that, like that's kind of scary to see that because usually what can happen is that you're, that person just might have a very low body composition or not enough fat and then is making up this kind of decision on what's going on from their dogmas. And yeah. 
No, it's true. I, yeah, I, I lived in a vegan community, and and that was happening. Women were were you know missing their cycle, not getting it anymore, and yeah, I don't think that's a sign of health or high advancement or or anything. So you know, I know it's it's easy because you and I come from a background of, of veganism. We've been down that road, and um, you know, I, I never try and tell anyone or convince anyone like what they should do. It, it, like you say, it really is about that experience. Mm -hmm. um, I think vegetarian can work. You have to be really careful. Uh, but veganism, I'm just not convinced. Um, great, I'm not about to fight with anyone, but you know, be really cautious and careful because uh, it really does, like you say, from cultures throughout time and history, there hasn't been that example. And from the hundreds, thousands of people that have, have tried it, uh, a lot of uh, problems do crop up, you know, sooner or later. Yeah. Um, I would like to speak to, you know, because again, you mentioned that whole spectrum. We have like traditional food diets and paleo diets and this and that. And, you know, Atkins, I mean, that's a number of years old now, but... Um, kind of pulling it out on that macro level, um, you know, we need to, obviously need to be really careful of, of the types of animal foods, be it milks or cheeses or meats that we're consuming. And uh, maybe you can speak to like, you know, why that is and in particular, maybe on a hormone level, how maybe the conventionally raised uh, meats. I mean, I remember parents, you know, I was in high school at the time, but parents, uh, friends of mine, their parents had gone on the Atkins diet. And, and what that meant was they just went to Costco and they loaded up on like pork and this and that. And it's all this conventional meat. And it's like, you know, that's not healthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because having meat like that, and if you go, if you have your macros all balanced out, you might get a beautiful body, but inside it might not be very healthy because the first thing is um, with with red meat, you really want grass-fed because grass-fed means that it has a proper amount of fats in it. If you actually eat grass-fed meat, you're going to get omega-3 fats from the red meat, which you do not get um, from the grain-fed meats. So that's an important thing. But one actually interesting fact I've learned in my research is there's a lot of hype about hormones in the meat. And that's actually, even in conventional meat, that's not, that's something you actually don't have to worry about. Okay. Because um, what I was saying, not saying that you should still not, still, that you should eat conventional meat, but there's a lot of people that try and sell you hormone-free meat. Right. But, um, so as I was telling you, remember that the soy vegetable oil has 100,000 units of estrogen. Yeah. Um, but meat, um, beef, has four units. Wow. Even if it's um, if it's not if it's not hormone fed meat, it's three units, and if it's um, ones that have hormones, it's four. Okay, so that's in the the meat, like the muscle tissue. Like what? About, yeah. What about the fat or the milk? Would you would you get hormones through that? Um, I'm not sure. That's a good question, actually, because I wonder what they're testing when right. they yeah. are they testing the fat or are they testing that? Right. But yeah, dairy is interesting because it is um, it is a hormonal substance. Oh, right? for sure, right? Um, yeah. And I think yeah, you really do want to try and get the best quality that you can because you don't want to you want to make sure it's from healthy cows because regular dairy it does have hormones in it that the cow's naturally producing but if you get grass-fed you're gonna have just it's gonna produce the right types of hormones yeah usually yeah what I'm trying to say the hormones that they inject the cattle with um, people try and sell like um, a and W is like oh our meats hormone free and right. it's it's just not um, it doesn't make a difference really when you actually study it so you don't have to worry about that but with dairy it's like when the cow is not healthy it's probably not gonna have the best hormones or the best fats in it and there's also the thing about what they're feeding them so if the cows are having pesticide laden grains Oh yeah, I mean, I actually just because I was in the area, not because I particularly love this type of cheese, but we went to uh, a cheese factory out in uh, the West Coast. It was in Oregon, uh, the Tillamook Cheese Factory, which um, some people might recognize the brand. Um, anyways, uh, we did the little tour and walked around, and they, I mean, a first of all, like you just unmistakable, you know, horrible smell, like just in the parking lot, right? Like, I mean, they're using, you know, a lot of, uh, yeah, intensive farming, factory farm type conditions for their, for their cows. And they, you know, quite proudly, they're showing you, here's our process, you know, and it's like, here's the feed. And a lot of it was just like, oh my gosh, like you're feeding that to the cows? Like, um, you know, cotton seed, for instance, and soy meal and, and this kinds of things, you know, crops, like you say, that are known to have, 
AI high amounts of estrogen like the soy or chemically grown um, as well and, and no doubt that uh, begins to come through the milk. Oh yeah, for sure. And, and soy is such a big feed for cattle. I think the reason people are cutting down the rainforest, it's n they're cutting it down to produce soy crops that aren't for humans, they're actually for the cattle. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's like, they, I'm sure there's a lot of cows that are fed like soy that's giving them a lot of estrogen. So yes. yeah, definitely getting grass fed, organic, like the most highest quality meat and dairy that you can. And it's very easy now to find grass fed beef. Even co-op sells grass fed beef now. So yeah. it's very, you can find it very easily. And yeah, that right animal products are really important for hormone balance. So you don't want to just have anything. Um, you really do want the right ones too. Uh, because those zine pesticides and herbicides, those are one of the biggest sources of xenoestrogens. So the fake estrogens that your body is going to absorb because it doesn't know the difference sometimes between the good and the bad estrogens. Right. They're just not, they've only been around for a couple hundred years and our genetics, humans have been around a lot longer. So yeah. that's another thing that I think a lot of people need to realize is that the regular, our life, the chemicals that we're exposed to in the regular diet, it's only been a few generations that we've been exposed to it. And think of all the diseases now that we have now compared to even before. And this has only been after about six generations, even less. Yeah, like that my grandma are... was eating a really traditional farm diet. Yeah, yeah, and and you know a lot of those diseases have been correlated to to the diet we're consuming, and yeah, I was having a conversation with Luca about this, and and just this kind of pendulum swing of you know like we've gone so far one way that uh, yeah it's really showing up, and and thank goodness now there's this trend back to real food, and and like you say that's why you can begin to see it now, and the you know the more con conventional grocery stores uh, better choices just because a we're realizing that, and you know it tastes better, and it's just a higher quality, mm -hmm. and it's what our bodies are are needing and demanding yeah definitely it's yeah. so important and yeah the optim the optimism around that as well is as much as we've kind of maybe you know degenerated uh from that over the generations uh i think you hear of incidences of these types of you know food related illnesses whether it's diabetes or you know whatever the the condition that's going on um showing up earlier and earlier is that it, it can be reversed right and there's so many mm -hmm. people that are working with food and herbs and nutrition to to be able to reverse it oh yeah it's amazing how our bodies heal quite fast yeah yeah so do you have any uh what's what's like an an author or a book that you've really been inspired by that you'd love to share that might help someone listening on on their journey um like on hormone balance on anything whatever whatever comes to mind maybe it's herbs and, and learning that approach or yeah specifically if it's hormone balance or it's food you know that helps shift your perspective Mm hmm Yeah, you know, the first one that's coming to mind, I can't think of many hormone books right now, um, but I know that, yeah, the Full Moon Feast, that one was one of your favorites, it but was. I really love that book. I could probably find it even <laughs> in my bookshelf, but I find that that is a really great book that really reflects about traditional food and what our bodies are designed for and they really also explore the because um, the lady that wrote it used to be vegan and she really explores her her journey with going to traditional foods and really addresses a lot of the myths in that book too yeah. and I really love that for people that are just wanting um, questioning veganism and vegetarianism to like look at that book because it's definitely a classic and it's had a lot mostly everybody that's read it has found had an amazing experience reading it yeah totally and, and the other thing it did for me as well was just to help bring food in just a more kind of healthy holistic uh context so the <laughs> the author is jessica prentice if, uh, yes for anyone listening jessica out. prentice full moon feasts yeah, cool. Well, it, since there aren't many uh, books on uh, hormones, uh, maybe maybe it's for you to write. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm really excited. I'm going to be launching um, on March 15th, so I'm not sure when this is, podcast is going to um, I'm going to be launching an online eating for your cycle course. So hopefully that will become a book one day too. That's the goal. Yeah, right on. Excellent. So yeah, tell us a little bit more about uh, where someone can find you and begin to work with you and, and that process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my website is naturalhormonehealing.com 
and also my Instagram at Natural Hormone Healing. And that's really the best place. And then I'm teaching lots of classes at the Light Cellar. And I'm hoping to do some more traveling this year as well, potentially going to Vancouver, Victoria, um, California. We'll see what else happens. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited for this year to really branch out and in going beyond the local food scene because, yeah, we have a lot of good stuff going on in Calgary, but I really want to spread this um, around Canada and the world. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, so wish you all the best on those travels and, and for everyone being able to reach you online. That's a, another great platform. And if, for sure, if you are in Calgary and you want to connect with Madeline, she does one-on-one -on -one consults. She does classes around town as well as at the Light Cellar and mm -hmm. Natural yeah. Horror. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and I also do Skype consults too. Oh, okay, perfect. Skype and Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having me here. This has been such a great conversation. I love, I could talk about this for hours. It's really such a passion. And yeah, I think it's something that's important to talk about exploring our relationship with food and health. And yeah, it, instead of just talking about yeah, the benefits of things. Let's talk about, yeah, like our journeys. It's an important thing. Yeah, for sure. Well, thanks for sharing your journey and uh, the insights you've gained uh, through that. And yeah, we got some great practical advice as well as some kind of opened up some bigger concepts for everyone listening to uh, take further and explore. So I'm mm -hmm. sure we'll, we'll chat again soon. And thanks so much for being on. Yeah, thank you.